we're seeing a lot of changes in trade patterns, in economic dealings, in payment systems around the world because of the war in Ukraine. Talk to us about what specifically that may mean in the area of technology, whether it's Russia or China, depending on which way China comes down. Well, David, it's actually an excellent point. And I think that the, the sad controversy of the Ukraine is just accelerating transition or changes that I believe will potentially occur. I mean, as you know, everybody's talking about Russia, but also the implications in U.S.-China relationships. And there's no doubt about it. And there's a lot of speculation that China and the U.S. will separate economically. Uh, I really don't think that'll occur. Um, the reason I say that is these economies are too large and too interconnected to the world. You mentioned payment systems, flow of capital, all those things these economies are dependent upon. So I don't think separation totally occurs. However, as I say that, I, there's no doubt, I believe, that when it comes to technology and future technologies, there's going to be competition between the two countries. And that's more so, I'll say, China, U.S., I mean, Russia really doesn't have the kinds of technologies that we're talking about. But if you think about things like semiconductors, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, cyber computing, clearly there's going to be competition. And therefore, I think there'll be less collaboration between China and the United States. So if that happens, because it certainly looks right now like that's where it's heading. We're not heading to a one big globe where we're all the same. and We all deal with each other. Maybe more separation, particularly in areas like tech. If that happens, how are we and for we for the moment, I'll say the United States situated because some people are concerned that China, for example, has really been investing a lot more in tech than we have been. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I think uh, last year alone it was 1.5 trillion. We're estimates in that range. So yes, China is out investing in the United States. They're not out investing the West. So I'll comment on that a little bit. But I mean, as you think about it, it's all this U.S.-China uh, focus. I mean, I call it the Super Bowl of geopolitics. You know, it's the Titans. Uh, if you look at it today, to use a sports analogy, the U.S. is about a three-point favorite in the game, going into the game. However, China is spending a lot and they're catching up and could have a heck of a fourth quarter. So my point being in that analogy, David, is the fact that the U.S. needs to leverage the world. It cannot go alone. And I believe there's great capability, what I'll say sports analogy, from an all-star team, there's great capability in Europe and Japan and Southeast Asia. So if the West could come together, i.e. as they've come together when it comes to the Ukraine, if they could come together and optimize their focus their investments, I think they clearly could continue to lead and out-compete China. So, Sam, I want to come back to if they can come together, because that could be a big if. But let's assume that could happen. Who's on our team, so to speak, to continue your Super Bowl analogy? Who are the major players in tech on our team? I think the major players, if you go through it, I mean, there's if you look at the, take semiconductors as an example, uh, I think it's a good example. Everybody's focused on manufacturing capacity called fabs. That's important because there's such a dependency on Taiwan and there's concerns and risk over China and the Taiwan, Taiwanese relationship. Having said all that, there's, there's different elements to the ecosystem in, in semiconductors. There's, fabric, there's the tools to fabricate, there's the design tools, there's the materials, there's packaging. And there's great expertise, especially in Europe. Europe has great research and great expertise in many of these areas. South Korea and Japan have great expertise in the manufacturing tools and manufacturing side of the house. So my point being is that if you look at the capabilities, the U.S. certainly leads today in design and packaging. There's no doubt about it. And the research capability. But you combine these capabilities between Europe, mostly Germany, uh, Japan, uh, and I say really South Korea and Singapore. But, you know, those countries within those regions, you can see how this thing could align. And they're, they're nations that the U.S. works quite well with, as you well know. So, Sam, I noticed you didn't mention Taiwan. Uh, and we hear a lot about Taiwan for manufacturing semiconductors, the largest chip manufacturer in the world. Are they a strength or a vulnerability, given their situation with respect to China? Uh, I, my opinion, and I've said this for the past couple of years, even before the situation today with Russia, is we need to lessen the dependency. The West needs to lessen the dependency on Taiwan. After observing what happened with Hong Kong, it's, it's hard to predict where Taiwan will end up long term. And it takes a long term to build this fab capacity. You just can't do it in six to nine months. You're talking years to build this capacity up around the world. And that's beginning today. Uh, there are two uh, 
funding proposals, one in the United States is the 51 billion that you hear about in the Innovation Act, that was the CHIPS Act. And there's another 40 some billion euros uh, going through the system in Europe. So that would be combined, it's, it's a significant amount of money to create these fabrication facilities uh, around the world. So that over time could lessen the dependency. But I think the West, and I mean the West, Western economies have to de-risk their exposure to Taiwan. Let's come back to that critical question of if we can get together on the same team here with some of the countries that you've mentioned. There are political aspects to that in the United States domestically. There's been some resistance to that. So sort of just let's make it sure it's made in America. What are the prospects of us overcoming that so we really have an essentially a really integrated trade when it comes to tech with Europe, with South Korea, with Japan? Well, I mean, I, I believe that I understand why it's important to create jobs within the United States. Uh, and this will occur. I mean, it just it, it depends on what areas we're focused on versus our colleagues. And what do I mean by that? Obviously, when Intel makes a $20 billion investment in Ohio, that creates jobs in the United States and that fabrication capability. As we do advanced research and design, that creates jobs in the United States. There's nothing wrong with Germany creating jobs or South Korea creating jobs, in my opinion, or Japan creating jobs. If you think about this, all these companies, all these countries, I should say, based upon this is the future, not the past, will be creating jobs. And these are highly skilled jobs. So you're not gonna be outsourcing manufacturing workers. I mean, if you look at a person that works in, in your average fabricator or the manufacturing capacity for a semiconductor, they tend to be a master's in electric engineering or, or PhDs in physics and things like that. The rest of the place is robots. So when we talk about these things, they're, they're capital intensive, but they're really highly, highly skilled, highly paid people. And I think the entire world will lift as we invest in, the, invest in those areas going into the future. Now, it's different, I understand discrete manufacturing, I'll call tops and bottoms, and I can understand where politics are on both sides of the pond as we talk about that. But this isn't that. High tech is not that at all. And they really should, I think, hopefully understand the difference between high tech and let's call it standard process or standard manufacturing. Sam, one major economy we've left out of the discussion so far, and that's India. Where do they come out in technology? They more or less are really working with Russia when it comes to oil and gas. What about technology? Uh, India is very good in software, and they have very good software capabilities. Uh, so in some of these areas, I, I went through quite quickly, I didn't focus on like artificial intelligence. They have pretty good capabilities around software. They do not have the expertise around the physics or the semiconductors or the electronics. And the reason why you need kind of combination of the above, even for artificial intelligence, especially for quantum computing, because if you think about what a semiconductor is in the software world of artificial intelligence, it is the engine. It's, it's the engine, it's the V12, not a V4. It's a V12 that's required to power these uh, systems that are going to analyze massive amounts of data and apply it. But India is strong in software. Uh, there's been challenges, you know, historically with India, more so than some of the other countries. But I do think they could participate, but it might be a little more complicated than, let's say, South Korea or Singapore, in Asia, that is, or Japan. <laughs> 